Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Australian Space Agency, Australian Space Discovery Centre digital Q&A with a space expert. My name is Nate Taylor. I'm a Senior Programs and Operations Officer here at the Australian Space Agency. And today we will be meeting with Leo Munkovich. Before we begin, I do want to acknowledge that we're meeting on the traditional lands of the Ghana people. And the Aboriginal astronomy aspect of uh, the traditional land is something that we here at the agency value quite highly. Now, you'll notice that in the logo behind me, um, that's made up actually of several Aboriginal constellations. And Aboriginal astronomers have been doing some amazing things, um, which is nothing short of science for up to 65,000 years. Uh, things like identifying stars based on their temperature, uh, their variability, using the stars for navigation, being able to identify seasons when it was right for harvesting different types of food sources, and even using the moon to determine when they could um, fish in certain spots. So uh, very valuable knowledge that we respect and draw on. But today we are here to speak to Leo. Um, so Leo, um, perhaps we could start uh, just by if you could tell us where you're joining us from today. Uh, good afternoon, I'm joining you from Canberra today. Fantastic. And um, I suppose, Leo, being in Canberra, this is where uh, the agency also has a another office um, and you do work for for the agency as well in the, the role of um, uh, launch safety officer. Right. So um, could you explain to us a little bit maybe about yourself? Um, and I think we've got some slides here that I'll, I'll use and uh, you can talk to those just to give us a little bit of an introduction to who you are. No problems. I'm uh, I'm a relatively newcomer to space. I, uh, I joined after a long period of time with with defence. Uh, where I spent over 31 years in Army, uh, predominantly uh, looking after explosive ordnance, explosives, explosives and ammunition testing, and uh, and a little bit of bomb disposal when I was when I was a bit younger. I started at Australian Defence Force Academy, uh, where I did a science degree, and throughout my career in uh, in army i've been fortunate enough to to be sent away to study both in australia and overseas uh, and that included a a number of master's degrees uh, as well as training in weapons and ammunition testing in the uk and bomb disposal or explosive ordnance disposal in uh, in the united states um, I, once I finished with Defence, I had a short period of time, so about 18 months, working for the Australian Federal Police in uh, in forensics uh, before joining the uh, the agency as uh, launch safety in July last year. Um, I've had two deployments to Iraq uh, and South Sudan. Uh, I visited many countries while I was with uh, the Army and and uh, and AFP uh, and lots of uh, hobbies, not enough time to do them all. Uh, scuba diving, camping, blacksmithing, uh, and I've got uh, adult children, uh, obviously a wife and uh, and some cats and dogs at home. So it's pretty well me. That's fantastic. Yeah, so we can see um, uh, several of the, the things that you spoke to then uh, on that slide. And I think it's really interesting actually to see the perspective of somebody who has spent so long in the army and then specialising in ordnance, explosive and testing um, before moving into AFP. Um, and I want to ask you about that uh, in a, a little while, um, but I, I just thought I would ask you very quickly, where was this scuba diving photo or is that a snorkel? No, that is a scuba Diving yeah, yeah. So where, that's, where, was, where was that taken? That particular photo, I think, was uh, possibly in Fiji earlier this year. Uh, mm. Most of the scuba diving uh, my wife and I do is on the east coast of New South Wales, but when we can, we get away to uh, to other places and uh, to try and enjoy the uh, the the warmer water where we can. 
Oh, fantastic. Did you have opportunities for, you know, those types of adventure sports or, or anything like that when you were actually um, in any of your deployments or any of your overseas visitations for work? Uh, yes, I did. I, in fact, what got me into scuba diving was uh, was what the Army called adventure training. So they had a two week activity. Uh, it was actually uh, in New South Wales where we went away and did a whole lot of um, recreational scuba diving. But in my uh, when I was in in the US, I had nearly nine months in Florida, and while I was there, uh, we did quite a bit of diving in uh, some of the caves in Florida, uh, the inland waterways, and uh, and also the um, the bay there. That's fantastic. It's it's actually amazing that you can um, kind of pair up, you know, those interests and with with work as well. I suppose is always the best. Uh, opportunity. That's great. Um, just bear with me. I've just had a bit of a technical difficulty with my computer. It just seems to have frozen up for me. Um, perhaps what we could do, uh, Leo, while I'm waiting for this to sort itself out, is uh, perhaps you could speak to the next slide, which is going to come up, and just let us know what, what are these images that we're going to be looking at here? Yeah, so, so those images there are a combination of images from a recent NASA uh, launch campaign that occurred in uh, in uh, the Northern Territory near Nullanboy. Uh, so the uh, the image to uh, uh, with me with a, a rocket in the background is the first experiment that uh, that was launched on the twenty sixth of of June. Uh, the image down the bottom is, I think it's the second experiment. So the NASA launches were what they call sounding rocket program. So that's where NASA will launch instrumentation for universities to, uh, to study uh, space science. So in this case, as they were looking at uh, uh, Southern Hemisphere constellations and taking measurements of things uh, such as uh, the light spectrum uh, and and the like. The center picture is the launch vehicle uh, from a launch attempt last year in South Australia, a commercial company called uh, TI Space or Australian subsidiary. Sorry, is um, uh, AT Space, and they uh, they uh, did a launch attempt last year. Uh, and in fact, they've announced that they're doing another uh, series of launches uh, in the next month or so. And the other uh, image of uh, is actually an image of a piece of space debris that uh, that uh, landed in Australia in the the first week or so of July. And uh, I was fortunate enough to to have to go down and have a look at that. That's down near Jindabyne. And uh, um, I got asked to go down and uh, and have a look at that, take some images, uh, record where uh, where it came down, so that we can uh, meet our international obligations to uh, to report to the United Nations and the uh, the country from where it was launched. Yeah, right. It's fascinating, isn't it? There's there's a lot of different activities, I suppose, that you're involved in. But perhaps you could walk us through. So, for instance, for those of us who who aren't really aware, um, when uh, Leah was talking about sounding rockets and talking about uh, the launches done with NASA out at the Arnold Space Center um, and the astronomical observations that they're doing, they were the first. Uh, the series of first commercial launches for Australia. So a really big achievement um, and to be partnering with NASA on those uh, missions as well is phenomenal. But perhaps, Leo, you could walk us through what I suppose a day in the life of uh, a launch safety officer looks like when you're attending a launch like that. What, what is it? What is it you're actually doing? Or what is your what is it you're checking? What's the process you follow? So um, so when the uh, when the minister grants a, a launch permit. At the same time as, as doing that, the minister will appoint a launch safety officer. So this is an appointment under the uh, Space Launch and Returns Act. Uh, and, and the role of that uh, launch safety officer is to ensure that the activity occurs safely, 
to make sure that appropriate notification is given to a whole range of, uh, of stakeholders and to ensure that the commercial operator who's who's conducting the launch uh, does so in in accordance with the, the conditions of their permit. So my role is uh, when appointed as launch safety officer is to to make sure that they're actually doing what they said they would do and that they're following the procedures that were underpinning the permit that the uh, the uh, minister granted uh, them. So it, it's predominantly checking to make sure that uh, that they're doing what they said they would do. Uh, in some cases, it's looking at the detail of, uh, of their procedures below the level of which they've provided to to the minister for uh, for the permit, just to make sure that uh, that th they're actually covered off on that that detail and that there's no no risk of harm to uh, to personnel uh, or, uh, or or property. So so it's checking to make sure they're doing what they said they would do, um, and just observing to make sure that uh, if anything uh, happens that's not really covered by their procedures that uh, that we can work through together to make sure that uh, that everything is is done safely. I see yeah so um, essentially they're going to be going through they're going to be doing all of their flight checks um, all of the fit checks on the rocket uh, they're going to be essentially following a, a set of conditions and then you are checking them off to make sure that they're they're meeting all of those requirements how, how is it that your experience I suppose because you, you haven't had experience launching rockets before right so how how is your experience from ordnance and from uh, the army uh, helped you in your role as a launch safety officer? Um, so so my experience in ordnance included, uh, you know, I guess, study use uh, and management of of rocket systems that were used for for defence. So that could include guided weapons uh, and uh, and sort of uh, ground based rockets and a large part of my career was spent at at test ranges so running test activities overseeing test activities and then commanding a number of test ranges so that background gave me a, a really good understanding of how these types of activities should be done to make sure that they're done safely and uh, and that sort of skill was directly transferable to 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 this kind of activity that's being done sort of in in the uh, the space sector and uh, and I was effectively recruited because of that background to to uh, to form this uh, to perform this role. Right, I see. Yeah, I, I can definitely see how that experience lends itself to to rocket launches, um, be it they whether they're commercial or scientific or, or what they are. Um, and you mentioned before that you were specifically recruited, I suppose, for this type of role. Um, so did you ever actually see yourself or did you ever think that space could have been a career for you? I mean, you, you spent so long in the army, uh, yeah. perhaps that wasn't something that was a tangible for you uh, and look you're right and and it wasn't so when I left the army I, I looked in for jobs in the kind of sectors that are aligned with defense so consulting back into defense as I said federal police forensics and forensics here we're talking about bombing type forensics uh, and assessments intelligence that sort of thing um, so I didn't really look at uh, look at that um space as a as a as an option and until until i was uh given a heads up that that, that the space agency in particular was looking for for a a person with my kind of background and i guess one of the things that really came out as i started that journey and and started the role is that um is that when you're when you're in a job and you have a particular kind of background, I had a sort of a, a science, science, quasi what I would term quasi engineering background. So I had a lot to do with systems engineering, uh, system safety. Those things are directly transferable, though I didn't recognise it until it was put in right in front of me. Are directly uh, transferable to uh, to this type of industry. Am I uh, are, as I said, a rocket 
that's used for uh, for space and a rocket that's used for defence, you know, have have you know almost identical attributes, other than, a, you know, a payload for a, a military rocket is a warhead of some sort, whereas for space it's instrumentation, or it's a satellite, or uh, or something similar. So so. There are, you know, very distinct parallels that I, I wasn't really aware of, you know, and and wasn't really looking at for uh, for employment until it was I was approached and it was sort of stuck in front of me as a as an option to you utilize you know, thirty years of skills I'd gained in the uh, uh, in the military for something that's um, you know quite different and quite refreshing and new for me. Mm, that's fantastic. You make a really good point, actually, about those skills which are transferable and, and not necessarily being aware of that until it's pointed out. And I think this is something where if you're interested in a career in space, um, a lot of people don't realise that there's so many different career pathways out there that they could be taking a more kind of traditional approach to a certain industry, mining or agriculture, for instance, and that even those skills and, and that role that they're doing could still be applied to the space industry and, and potentially as well uh, there's not en enough awareness I suppose on uh, the roles which are available in space um, so certainly uh, you know a launch safety we think of rockets and rocket scientists and and engineers but um, launch safety and kind of the, uh, the I suppose the, the checklist the regulation around it those types of things are probably less commonly thought thought about. Um, so I was actually hoping, hoping as well that you could speak a little bit to about what kind of drives you now to do what you're doing in in space. Um, what, what, what do you think is the most, I suppose, important aspect or, or the reason why um, what you're doing is important? Look, um, you know, I, I see I see the space sector as a as a, a growth uh, I guess industry. Um, I'm very passionate about about uh, safety and uh, and you know s safely doing activities. It was something that uh, really crystallised for me in the last sort of five or six years that I had I had in the army about um, what a, what a nice safe uh, activity looks like, and it's across the board. It's it's you know. Regardless of whether you're doing something in the space industry or you're doing something in mining or, you know, the petrochemical industry, the basic principles are the same. There's a little bit of difference when you're doing, um, you know, something at a, at a launch site, for example, but the, the broad principles about how you would operate that kind of activity are not not much different from from how you would would run a uh, another activity for say the petrochemical or the mining industry. So so those principles are the same. And uh, and the point that you made about um, where you come from from an industry perspective is that there's direct transferability between those sort of high hazard type industry experience to the space industry if you want to get involved in in the ground operations if you like of uh, of space activities yeah absolutely I, uh, I i completely agree and thank you very much for solidifying the point um i was hoping you could speak to actually just this image I, I know that probably a lot of people are interested in it in that piece of space debris um and you mentioned before about being sent to take some photos and do a bit of an, an investigation so what, what's kind of involved in that investigation because i suppose we're trying to determine you know what it is and where it's come from and that type of thing um so so how do you go about doing Doing something like that, investigating a piece of space junk. So, so in uh, in this case, uh, we effectively got notified that there was potential space debris in the Jindabyne area in New South Wales uh, because of uh, of media um, uh, media notifications, a couple of articles with ABC saying. What appears to be space debris, and then there was some uh, some expert uh, commentary from uh, some some experts in Australia that suggested that it uh, uh, that it could be um, it could be from from SpaceX 
uh, as it turns out, it's from a, a trunk. So in this case, it's quite an interesting journey because the vehicle that this was launched from was launched in uh, uh, in November 2020. Went to the to the space station with with crew, uh, and then separated from the space station in May last year, May 2021, with what's called a trunk. So it's basically a cylinder uh, with fins on it. As it left the space station, the 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 module separated, and that piece of uh, trunk had been uh orbiting the earth until it slowly degraded and burned up on re-entry in july and uh, we got notified that there were for, principally via the media and then with contact with the landowners and we went down to uh to confirm that it that it was space junk and then to work with uh with spacex in this case to uh to identify what components it was and and now what uh, what to do with it to meet our because um, there's a lot of uh, international treaties that govern what we do with this, so we've got a job to uh, to to work through that and to engage with the United Nations and with uh, with the launching country to make sure that mutually we all uh, all do the right thing in this case. Yeah, that's right. It's 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 a bit of a unique circumstance. This doesn't happen all that often, does it? But then it, when something like this does happen, you have to follow the, the right process there. And what what a, a a journey as well for this for this trunk to to go on, really. Um, do you have to have an understanding of advanced mathematics or orbital dynamics or anything like that in order to do the work that you've done here? Um not not particularly i uh, i have great access to uh to experts within the agency and also we have uh technical advisors that support the agency so uh, i can reach out to them to ask um to ask questions uh about uh, about about safety aspects particularly where you're talking about uh, calculator hazards to personnel for for space launches. Uh, so so I I don't have to have uh, um, a great uh, you know a deal of uh, of expertise in that sort of area. So yeah, that's fantastic, isn't it? It really speaks to the um, the interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary nature of the space industry, where you, you you don't have to have you know that knowledge of of mathematics. I suppose, like if you're interested in this type of work, you don't necessarily need to study mathematics at uni to do it. I'm sure it would help, but um, yeah. you don't you don't necessarily need to do that. Um, so maybe if we could move on to a slightly different topic, um, in terms of the future of space in Australia, you said that you you. You think that space is definitely a growth industry. So do you have thoughts or ideas on what space in Australia will look like over the next decade or so? Um, look, I, I guess the uh, the key thing that I see that will happen is that uh, the, you know, the space industry that Australia has substantially relied on overseas to Build satellites to launch satellites to to manage you know the ground sector. Um, all those things I think incrementally will will come and be a baseline part of Australian industry. So that we'll have facilities that will uh, will launch uh, rockets that will put Australian satellites that are built in Australia uh, for Australian use into space, uh, and we'll start to see. Uh, that sort of thing. So rather than sending a satellite overseas to be put into space, you know, we'll have, you know, uh, Australian industry will be launching it from Australia. Is is uh, and it'll be built in Australia uh, and then you know, for an Australian needs and potentially for overseas needs as well. So I sort of see that as uh, as sort of the natural progression uh, over the next sort of decade or so. Yeah, so it's really for Australia, I suppose, it's more about building that capability uh, for us to actually, you know, domestically be able to launch things into space and to have more space capability and sovereign assets, but then also potentially too in, in terms of commercial opportunities for overseas uh, projects or, or missions that would like to look at launching from Australia, such as um, the Equatorial Launch NASA yeah. um, 
partnership which was recently uh, being undertaken. It's, I, I think I agree with you and I think there's there's plenty of opportunities um, there for us to be able to really build up that capability. Um, I was thinking though, what do you think the biggest challenge to overcome in terms of the, the industry would be for Australia? Um, you know, I think that uh, it's, the industry's got to, I think, to some extent, accept that they've got to crawl and walk before they can run. There's a great deal of industry appetite and it just needs to be balanced with with growing the, the baseline capability um, in Australia to do things. I mean, there's great, there are companies out there that are doing great things, you know, developing, um, you know, high-tech rocket motors, for example, launch vehicles uh, that are working at a, you know, a great pace to uh, to deliver, um, uh, to, to deliver a capability. When that happens, um, uh, things won't go right. And I think the industry uh, and the nation has to accept that, you know, you know, things will fall over, things won't go to plan, and that's just part of the learning journey as we go forward. I mean, one of my roles is uh, is to do well, my role is not to stop things failing, but to accept that that can happen, and that we've got to accept that, provided that happens, for want a better term, in a safe manner, um, uh, we should be able to allow industry to 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 learn through that um, through their mistakes through um through failure as uh, as we go forward and not to uh, not to say oh, i didn't work we should stop it but to go okay let's dust ourselves off and let's let's get on and uh and work out what went wrong and uh and make sure the next time that that mistake isn't made again yeah, absolutely. I suppose that's really why um, a role uh, like yours or, you know, the regulation, the Office of the Space Regulator from uh, us here at the agency is so important to ensure that we do have those safeguards in place. And um, I, I do think that uh, learning from failure is also very important. I think it was, speaking of SpaceX, I think it was actually Elon Musk who, who said, if you're not failing, you're not thinking big enough or something along those lines. I'm paraphrasing um, there. So yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. Um, maybe we could think now about in terms of um, advice for anybody who would be looking to space for a career or indeed, um, I suppose, your own advice to yourself. What, what do you think the best piece of advice that you could give either to your younger self or to somebody who would be uh, looking to pursue space as a career? What do you think that would be? Uh, look, I guess that, um you know, I'd, I'd say two things. One is that you probably do need a science or technical background for most jobs in, uh, or most roles in, in the space industry. It's not necessarily the case, um, but uh, but take the opportunities uh, that, uh, that the system, if you like, has to offer in terms of uh, secondary and tertiary education and, and maximum, uh, take maximum advantage of that. And I guess the second thing is to don't sell yourself short. Um, when you've got a little bit of experience with whatever sector you're working in or whatever education you've got, um, you will be able to find a linkage to to a change in career that might be into the space uh, the space industry. You know whether it's customer service or whether it's you know, mining or an apprenticeship or anything like that. You know, all those jobs are required. You know, more broadly across the uh, the space uh, the space sector. So you're able to uh, um, you'll have skills that we'll be able to use. So so um, don't sell yourself short. Um, and uh, um, and I had those com so sorts of conversations with my uh, with my children about yeah you might work at the YMCA but you can actually translate that into tangible skills that can apply pretty well in any any industry. Yeah, I, I am also a testament to that as well. Uh, I came from a finance background prior to uh, making my way into the space industry. I mean, I did do applied physics and mathematics kind of along the way, um, but there are always other pathways. And I agree that you can't sell yourself short and have to look for those opportunities as well. I might um, quickly now just 
open the floor up to uh, questions from the audience. Um, we do have one here which was published by Aidan. I don't know if you can see that, uh, Leo, but Aidan asks, um, or he says, firstly, hello from the United States, which is fantastic. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, what was your worst career challenge and how do you overcome any roadblocks related to this challenge? Uh, look, that's a, uh, a really um, interesting question. Um, and I'm not quite sure how. I mean, I was I was I was quite lucky um, that uh, uh, the army is is like a very supportive work environment, um, and that uh, um, if you want to do something and you advocate for yourself enough, um, you you will get to uh, you you'll you'll succeed. And uh, um, they look more on effort than, uh, in some cases, than results. Particularly when you when you're doing training, they'll look at how well you apply yourself, rather than necessarily how well uh, how well you uh, how well you actually do in a particular uh, a particular course. Um, you know, I guess one of the the worst career challenge was probably at a time when. Um, uh, I was um, effectively accused of 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 not doing my job effectively enough, um, and in a military sense, it was a effectively a formal accusation that required investigation. And uh, um, while at the end of it, I was uh, I was cleared. Um, it took a real um, toll on me in terms of um, really questioning. What I was doing while I was doing it was my approach to work, um, uh, the right approach. In the end, I had to sort of go, you know, and it was a lot of self-reflection. And I guess the the lesson I took out from it was that throughout your career, you have to be able to look at yourself, look at your performance, look at what you're doing and how well you're doing it, uh, and go, am I doing, um, am I doing a good job? And be really honest and critical with how uh, how you're approaching, and go, okay, I need to change, or or I'm happy with what I'm doing. Uh, and in some cases, you make decisions about, well, I probably should change, but that aspect I'm not going to prioritise over something else that's more important. So it's being able to really look critically at yourself, and uh, and be honest with 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 how you are and uh, and and your work, work performance. Very good advice indeed. Thank you for sharing something which must have been um, quite stressful and um, uh, it must have been very difficult to, to work through. And uh, yeah, I, I could definitely see how that would be uh, the greatest challenge. It's never it's never nice to think that you're not effective at what you're doing or to have and to have that in a formal setting. That's also uh, very difficult. But uh, do you think that the I suppose the the credo, the ethos, like the the mental toughness and form fortitude that you would have gained from your you know your kind of military training do you think that actually contributed to you being able to overcome that look I do and I also um, think that a an organizational approach to personnel management where you have active uh, review of your own performance, you know, annually and biannually, and where as part of my role, I was also required to to um, uh, to look at my subordinates' uh, performance, you know, gauge how effective they were, uh, to provide critical uh, feedback, good, positive, negative, or whatever, uh, and uh, and help them to to work through things that would help them achieve their career goals. I think. An organisation that does that um, teaches you, forces you to be self-aware, if you like, and uh, and to to be able to look at uh, look at uh, how well you're doing your job and what you can do and with yourself, um, and and to be honest with yourself, um, and uh, and the organisation instilled that in from a you know right from the start. Um, so uh, so that certainly helped me in uh, in that case. Yeah, and this does also kind of go back to what you were talking about before, where, um, for instance, if you would like to launch a rocket, um, you're probably going to 
have come up against some difficult challenges and indeed some failures, right? And I suppose the importance of having failures along the way so that you can reflect on them and that you can do better. I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to, to maintain this certain level of performance, which obviously we want to strive for excellence. Yeah. Uh, but understanding that uh, yeah. yeah, learning from failures yeah. along the way to improve is an important aspect of that. Yeah, and and you're right. And you, I think the other key thing with that too is that you really have to know uh, what it is you want to do, um, and and all those things that might stop you. So what are what are the regulations? You know, from a space point of view, it's not just space regulations. There's state legislation, there's CASA regulations, there's maritime regulation, there's international law. So there's a whole lot of things you really have to really understand what you're doing before you start to know what are the things I have to address and fix and deal with in my journey uh, and, uh, and to be able to map them out and to start to plug away uh, at them so that you don't miss something critical sort of at the at the last moment and go oh look I uh, you know I didn't get a particular approval in time um, so I can't do what I want to do for example so you've really got to know what it is you're going to do and that's that's a lot of research you've got to really really do an analysis of what you want to do up front uh, rather than just get an idea and run with it you've really got to know the context in which you're going to do that idea if you like. Uh, and that I think is really important. Yeah, absolutely. For space activities and applications, and this may sound a little bit cliche, I suppose, but how, how important do you think um, the reason why is uh, behind these activities or the reason why, like for instance, if you're like you, if you said, you've got to understand the regulations or, um, you know, if there's a CASA instrument that you need to obtain or, or et cetera. How, how important do you think a deep understanding and belief in that, that reason why actually is? Oh, look, I think uh, it's it's the thing that will motivate you to, to keep going. I mean, tied with that, you know, from a business sense, obviously will be allocation and prioritisation of resources, you know, financial people to achieve your outcomes. And you've, you know, along the way, it's a bit like, you know, I've got a bit of a background in project management. Uh, you've you've got to be able to make those those decisions and trade-offs about what's what's important, what's going to get me what I want to achieve. Uh, and and I guess the quality of 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 the outcome will be uh, will be influenced by a whole range of uh, a whole range of um, of factors that you then have to decide what's more important uh, in in order to achieve your 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 goals in the end. Yeah, absolutely. Look, we've had uh, two questions which have come in which are very similar to each other, so maybe you can speak to those. So the first one is talking about a career highlight and why it was special for you. And the other one by Sam actually goes into a little bit more detail and asks about the most interesting or coolest uh, uh, launch rocket satellite or project that you've been involved with and what the objectives were. So um, maybe you could speak to that, Leo. Uh, look, um, I guess the most coolest interesting launch was the recent launch campaign by NASA in in the Northern Territory um, and it was I think really interesting from from a couple of aspects first it was doing science from Australia that could only be done in the southern hemisphere so they were looking at southern hemisphere constellations uh, uh, Alpha Centauri I think it was um, uh, for, for a couple of the uh, um, a couple of launches and it said they could only be done in Australia. Uh, it was, you know, universities out of, uh, out of uh, the US were basically um, sponsored by NASA to do these. Um, and to, to answer questions like what does a habitable planet potentially look like? You know, so that so that can feed the science of uh, of you know astrophysics and astro astronomy for the future when we're looking at uh, at uh, at other planets elsewhere. So you know, really, really exciting stuff. And um, what was interesting, 
uh, the, the whole launches were about 15 to 17 minutes long, uh, of which, you know, in the middle was a five minute, what would, would be termed a science window, which was the, the period at which uh, the instruments were, were operating uh, and the scientists were, were gathering data. Uh, and then, you know, they close up the instruments effectively and it would return and be recovered and potentially be reused uh, in the future. One of the uh, instruments, for example, the uh, the telescopes that was used for the third launch, it was the third time it had been used in Australia. It had been used in, I think, 1987, uh, in 1996 from Woomera, and then in, uh, in Australia this year. You know, out of 18 launches for that particular instrument, three of them were from Australia, so I thought that was particularly cool. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, those those missions themselves were fantastic. I I, yeah. I live streamed and watched the uh, the launches. Uh, I couldn't couldn't be there and attend in person, obviously, yeah. like you. But um, it was great. And you, yeah, you're right. You know, our unique position, I, I suppose, like our geographic location, means that we do have some real distinct advantages, particularly for uh, astronomical observations like that that can only be completed in the southern hemisphere, but also for getting into things like polar orbits, right? Like, um, yeah. and, and Australia, a lot of people might not know, like you mentioned that instrument had been used previously in one of the places it was used was at Woomera Rocket Range in South Australia. And that's the thing, we've been, we have actually been launching rockets in this country um, since, you know, late 40s uh, down at that Woomera rocket range complex. Um, although, it, you know, no longer is really used as an active site today, we, we have had this, this strong space heritage in, in launch and it's something that I think we we still do have uh, quite a bit of expertise in. So it'd be very exciting to see more. Yeah, and, and you're right, and I think the uh, the NASA launches, um, so it was the second launch permit granted in Australia under the current um, uh, regulation uh, set, uh, the, the, the first uh, successful launch, and it was done by, you know, a commercial operator uh, hosting uh, NASA in Australia. It was the first time NASA had a commercial contract to, to do that. Uh, there, there are other uh, launches outside of uh, the US are done on uh, on sort of government operated ranges. So it's so many firsts in in that respect, and uh, and a testament to to where the industry is at the moment and where it's going in the uh, in the future. I think so. So it was a really good outcome to uh, to see that happening and to be to be part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And look, we've uh, probably got time for one more question. So there was a question here about who inspires you and why. So I suppose we can expand that question to be who or what inspires you and why? Um, look, I think the uh, um, th there's not a particular who that uh, that I sort of look up to, um, but I guess uh, what the space industry uh, and and what the the companies who are seeking to launch in Australia have done for me personally is that they've given me a you know a second career that's that's exciting and new um, and it's it's something I'd never done before uh, and it's it gives me an opportunity you know. At my stage, where you know, you know, where I'm heading towards retirement in another decade or so, that but I can still engage my mind, think through new problems. It's not just an old problem; it's a completely new problem to me and to Australia in a lot of cases. To be able to, you know, be part of of what is still quite a young industry from uh, from a very early stage, and to to be able to really contribute to 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 Australia, to to you know sovereign capability to to this industry, and uh, and 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 be there from the grassroots to uh, to be able to help um, guide the uh, the industry, and and to me that is that is really exciting um, and and fun to be to be able to to do that. 
Yeah, I uh, hope you'll forgive me for using the pun, Leo, but um, definitely exciting and important new orbital trajectory that you are on <laughs> with your career in launch safety. Uh, look, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Uh, to all of our attendees here, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, Leo, it's been an absolute treat. Um, and I want to just uh, finish up by saying that if you are interested in a space career, um, if you would like to look at doing something similar to what Leo does or indeed anything to do with space, um, please come along to the Australian Space Discovery Centre if you have the opportunity. We'd love to have you. Um, you can go to our website, discover.space.gov.au to learn about that and our other online programs and also about other space careers. Uh, I think we will leave it at that, uh, but thank, thank you once again for joining us. And Leo, thank you very much for all of your insights. It's much appreciated. My pleasure. All right. Thank you, everybody. We will see you in the next one.